One of our key behaviours is we embrace change. When we employ people, one of the first things we say is, look, we're a changing business. So one thing, if you if you don't like change, you're not prepared to learn and change, mm. we're not the right group for you to work for. In this episode of The Little Black Book, I'm joined by Tom Caesar. Tom is the co-founder and CEO of Positive Group. Positive Group use innovative platforms and technology to provide fast lending solutions to individuals and businesses. In 2016, Positive Group were awarded the Small Business of the Year at the Telstra Business Awards, and in 2017, they were awarded Innovator of the Year at the Australian Broker Awards for their Notify platform. In this episode, talks about the challenges he faced as a young entrepreneur and business owner. He describes how he developed a winning team culture and how he works with his team to embrace change and be comfortable being uncomfortable. He talks about the importance of feedback loops and developing trust within your team to help stay on track with key priorities. Tom talks about his advisory board and how he has gone about selecting members to add value to the business. He also shares about how understanding his customer needs and their friction points help create an award-winning tech product. Welcome to The Little Black Book, a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs who provide their first-hand experiences to help others learn and grow. This podcast is brought to you by Altitude Advisory. Altitude Advisory is a modern business advisory firm helping business owners build a better business for a better life. Mate, favourite movie of all time? Favourite movie? That's a good one. We were actually probably talking about it this morning. It was actually The Concussion. I think we were talking oh, yeah. about because we were watching uh, – current affair last night about yeah. the, the concussions in footy and yeah. we were talking about sort of Will Smith as a whole and we were actually yeah. talking about I said it's one of my favourite movies of all time just when the, the little man wins after fighting for something he believed in something like that it was yeah, uh, yeah so that's definitely one of my all time favourites yeah it's definitely a, a, a really cool story but you know I guess about persistence and you know obviously quite a serious issue Correct. but just persistence and, and you know big fight against you know an individual against a massive organization <laughs> and machine yeah that did everything to to basically suppress it or or, or keep him keep him down so. definitely and i think it's a, a good story about you know the the right thing has come out of it and if you have a look at what's going on around the world with concussion and sport being a true story too i love movies that are true stories yeah so it was uh yeah that's definitely right up there yeah that's really cool mate is, is there a book that as a child or a young adult that had a real profound impact on you and why yeah, there'd be um, one in particular for me was um, was probably Richard Branson's, to be yeah. honest. You know, I know it's a, a bit corny with uh, a, a young business owner looking up to someone like him, but mm. I saw him speak at a conference t 10 years ago and just a few things he said just blew my mind, just real simple business philosophies. And yeah. I read his book and it just changed my mindset on on everything, I think. And yeah. and I think that was probably a, a big turning point for me, that, that sort of probably – got me into reading a lot more, you know, non-fiction books and sort of business books. And that was probably the catalyst for that because suddenly I, I, I realised I loved to learn about business, yeah. um, not just financial services. Yeah. So, so is that something that's now part of your routine in terms of, you know, reading and, and is that an important part of your own development then? I, as I a, try to. Yeah. Try to. Once I travel, when I travel, I yeah. read a lot Yeah. and then I come back and it probably takes a few weeks to get back into that rhythm of reading again. But yeah. Um, certainly like to when I can. It's something that I have to remind myself to probably do. Love watching, you know, docos and and TV series, and docu series, and things like that. Yeah. But I find reading's just really good to relax my mind as well. So um, I do enjoy it. Cool. Have you graduated to audio books yet? I tried it. I tried it. I, I jumped onto Blinkist and uh, thought oh, I'm going to give this a crack. I didn't mind it, but I, I felt like it almost kept my mind going more right. and not relaxed. And what, yeah. what I like about reading a book is it it just helps me switch off the mind a little bit. Yeah, okay, so cool. I think the, the audio books are sort of almost too accessible yeah, it, <laughs> and staying away from the phone. Yeah, it's interesting the, the different dynamics. My, uh, and, you know, I've been having a chat with my wife. She's she's never been a reader. Like, you know, I could have counted on one hand the number of books that she's read <laughs> in the time that I've known her. But I got her onto Audible and since the first of, well, literally in the last eight weeks, she's read five books yeah. or listened to five books. And I'm going, this is, this is something not Something's quite adding addi up here. It's, it's not quite right. It's, it's a good so. example. I suppose everyone almost learns and does things differently Correct. like that. Like yeah. if they were all TV series, I'd probably sit there and you know what you know watch them. But yeah. 
um, there's probably not enough. That's that's why you know yeah. probably end up having to buy a few more books. Yeah. So, so now, now, Mark, I know you're into your travel. Yep. Is there a, a travel experience that that you've had that has been really transformative for you, either in a in a personal sense, in a learning sense, an emotional sense, or something that you've taken into business with you? Yeah, there's definitely a few, but I think the the most sort of pivotal travel trip that I had was when I was about 20. I took off for my gap year then. Yep. So I'd sort of finished an internship in financial services and yeah. was a bit unsure what I wanted to do. I, I was about to buy a house and then something sort of came over me and I walked across the road to Flight Centre on my lunch break and spoke to the girl and I just bought a round-the-world ticket. Yeah. Um, off I went for 12 months. So I spent the next 12 months in uh, Canada working there to begin with and mm-hmm. then we bought a car in the States and drove around the States with three of my best mates for, yeah. for two or three months and, and finished up in Europe. So, yeah. you know, as a 20-year-old and and doing that, you know, I was forced to grow up um, mm. pretty quickly and, and they were the days of no smartphones as well. So yeah. we when we bought our car to, to travel around the States, four blokes, 20, 21, had the, the choice of a, a GPS yeah. or a um, satellite radio because there was no Spotify or anything back yeah, then. Yeah we decided that we'd go for the satellite radio and not a GPS. So we're still using paper maps. So yeah. that was a massive learning experience for me, just different cultures. Um, and just, I think it, it really taught me to appreciate what we've got here in, in Australia. You know, we're very lucky, you know, the life mm. that we, we get to live here in a, in a safe country. And, you know, I think by, by doing that trip, it forced me to really appreciate that a bit more and yeah. um, and look for a bit more. Yeah. No, that's really cool. How did you find, you know, all the different people that have gone and done those trips with their mates? <laughs> are you still mates? Oh, we are. We are. Like, when the four of us get together, there's um, there's some really good stories. You know, I think there, there's times where we had, you know, a, a tyre blowout in a freeway in the middle of um, the desert in Texas and a police officer pulled over and we sort of weren't too sure if we were really allowed to be driving there on our our licenses yeah, or not because yeah. we'd been there for a longer period of time. So we were still a little unsure, but we thought we'd just wing it. And when the when the police officer pulled over, we thought, oh, you know, uh, if we uh, are we going to be in trouble here? And he was fine. He, he followed us for 250 Ks to the next town to make sure we got a tyre because we had one of those smaller oh, yeah. um, spares. So um, he looked after us for the next six hours until we got uh, a tyre and then gave us his hat to say, really had a good time hanging out with you guys. Well, so there's, there's lots of little stories like that and, you know, a few more that are better over a beer. But, yeah, um, yeah we had a we had a great time and um, I think that that's a bond that, you know, yeah. we'll always have. No, that's really cool. And it's, it's good to hear that he actually drove you out of town to help you, not just <laughs> just drove you to the edge of the town limits just to make sure you said, clear, go. cleared out of your precinct. <laughs> Mate, you, you co-founded a Positive Group back in 2009. Now, and you said, yeah, you had a – I guess a, a bit of a, a you know education in financial services and stuff like that. How did you get into it? What what made you get into your own business? What was the the catalyst? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd had two jobs, um, one before that trip and, and one after it, both in financial services. And my my old man was in the same industry, but mm-hmm. he was a, a state manager more in the resident residential lending side. Whereas yep. my background was was I'd, I'd spent the four years in in asset finance. Yeah, he got made redundant. Um, in early 2009 and we'd been talking a bit, you know, probably a bit more casually about we should do something together and that was the catalyst for us. We said, well, what have we got to lose? Let's yeah. let's give it a crack. And so we, we had a bit of a focus on residential lending to begin with and, yeah. um, you know, I'd resigned from my job and, and we had built a website and learned, you know, learned a bit about digital marketing. So, well, let's get into asset finance because people buy cars a lot quicker mm. than they buy a house and yeah. we needed to pay the bills. So, you know, did a little uh, Google course and uh, built a website and set up Salesforce and we started digital marketing. And that was the moment that I think the business changed direction forever. And we haven't looked back since because everything we did then was, you know, focused on being a digital business. And, yeah. and being back in 2009, it was it was quite rare for everyone to be wholly and solely focused on digital like that. Yeah. So it was such a good opportunity because Google, well, Facebook marketing hadn't even kicked off then, but yeah. it was so cheap compared to now. So yeah. I could probably get twenty leads back then for what I pay for one now. Yeah, so, wow. Um, so yeah, that that was the uh, the beginning of of Positive yeah. Group. Yeah, that's really cool. Now you started with your dad. Talk talk to me about the dynamics of being <laughs> in business with you know, in family business with your dad. Yeah, you know, he's obviously come out of a, uh, an environment there where you, you know he just said he was made redundant yeah. and you know into this. How, how has that dynamic worked, and and how have you made it work for for this long? Yeah, I think you know he's he's sort of um, 
in uh, in in the process of, of retiring at the moment, and he's been uh, been really good to let me just sort of drive the more the the tech and digital first approach to the business. And yep. you know, it's been a it's certainly had tough times too. I'm not going to sit mm. there and say family business is easy because if there's anyone that says it is, um, you know, <laughs> it's a lie because yeah. you know the the biggest challenge has probably come to keeping your personal relationships personal because mm. even when you get to a family dinner, you can't help but have a a business conversation. So, yeah. you know, we've tried to separate that as best as we can. Uh, we've had our arguments over the years, that's for yeah. sure. But also by, by being family, it means you get a bit more flexibility too. So mm. there's pros and cons with it, but it's certainly, um, you know, it, it's been a, an, a big learning curve and a, a big journey over the last 12 years. Yeah. Is there anything particular that you and your dad have done in terms of structures you know, whether that might be independent people coming out and sitting on, you know, coming in and sitting on advisory boards or anything like yeah. that to help to help that dynamic for you guys. Definitely, we've we've um, had, we've done a few things over, you know, over probably more the last probably yeah you know, five to six years ago. We probably started doing a, a bit mm. more of that. And we got a group in leading teams in to, to help us. We've we've also got a, a young leadership team as well. So yep. I think the dynamic of having such a young leadership team as well, we yep. we all agreed that we needed a feedback driven leadership program that. Yep. Can help drive better standards from a young team, and the reality is, if if someone's not holding up their end of the bargain or doing their job, we wanted to be able to have those conversations quickly. So, mm. um, Daniel Healy from Leading Teams came in and and did you know some work with you know both me and Dad personally, and mm. and and for the whole senior team. And you know, after a couple of years, we we rolled his program out across the whole business. So yeah. that's been something that we did, and we also set up an advisory board. About three and a half years ago, that mm-hmm. was for about 18 months prior to we took an investment from a, an ASX listed company, Resimac, almost two years ago, and, and then yep. we formed a proper board. So yep. that's put a bit more structure into the business. No, cool. And, you know, Daniel, you know, I know Daniel really well. We Great actually do, do a bit of work with him ourselves. Oh, and he's, he's a good mate of mine as well. He's, like, he's, a, he's yeah. a ripper. He's, yeah. uh, he's done a lot to help me yeah. and we've sort of built a friendship over the years and yeah. um, love working with him. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot about that culture and that communication and the frameworks and that building of relationship and trust within the organisation. Yeah. So, so how, how do you manage to roll that out and then keep momentum? With that, I think it, it's definitely given us the platform to uh, have tough conversations quickly, yeah. um, build really long lasting relationships amongst the team. And I think, you know, we've got there's a couple of the senior guys in particular in, in the team, and we've got relationships where we're, when we're direct, we know we're, we're doing it because we mm. care, we, uh, we do it to, to help each other improve. And to other people, there's, you know, it could be looking like an argument, but we get to a really good solution at the end of it and walk away and we know that we're, you know, yeah. we're, we're the that we've we've all got a uh, a mentality of that we want to improve the business and and we mm. want to improve each other. So it's taken time, but we've we've stuck to it over you know five to six years. And it, it's probably if I'm if I'm honest, it's it's weeded out a, a few of the cancers yeah. along the way, which is yeah. you know always hard to to say yeah. in a public forum, but it's the truth. You know, cancer can spread so quickly through an organisation mm. and. You know, there's been times where we've just had to cut them out and and, and let some people go, and and mm. it's um, that platform and programs allowed us to do that. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, it's interesting. You know, I know you like your your footy, your AFL, and your sport. Leading teams obviously originated through there. Do you do you think some of that? You know, and I'm sure you probably had an awareness of of that just through your your sporting background and stuff like that. Do you think it's easier to roll out because of that? That dynamic or that awareness that that you you have for that type of relationship, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. You know, we a few of our guys have had sort of footy backgrounds as well, and and are into that. But it, it was it's probably just been a lot more of when it comes to sport and a program like leading teams. Um, quite often, it's just in that professional environment. But mm. you know, I think he says ninety five percent of the business is is in the sort of corporate yeah. world, and I think. We can, you know, in sport they can measure it by a premiership, and for us to measure culture, it's it's really tough, and that's mm. that's probably one of the hardest parts to truly measure. Yeah, but we're we're you know we're certain that it's improved improved that in our business and yeah, our okay. in our communication. Do do you measure it? Do you, do you have any formal measures or anything like that where you track like your employee net promoter score or any of that sort of stuff in in terms of the organisation? Yeah, we've got a small internal factors like that that we do review, yeah. but there's there's probably not one particular KPI that we we can use. You you've also mm. got to I think use your gut. You know, if there's staff turnover goes up, well, yeah. well, why is that? And I think the biggest thing that we've tried to do through the program is give our 
our staff member at every level of voice. We want ideas. We want we want feedback, good or bad, for us as well. You know, mm. I want a person who's been there for for three months to come to me and give me feedback. I want everyone to be comfortable doing that. And um, if we're not doing that, then that's you know that's probably not the culture that we've you know we, we've been striving for. But yeah. I think the the other part of it is we we always say we're always striving for perfection, knowing we'll never get there. Mm. And if we stop working on culture, I think we've failed. Yeah. So. No, cool. You mentioned the advisory board and, and now the formal board. Mm-hmm. How do you go about picking those people and finding the right people to add value to your organisation? Yeah. Firstly, we did a bit of a skills matrix of, yeah. of what probably what I in particular needed with the advisory board. And, and we got some people with in various backgrounds. So a bit of a skills matrix was a, a big one to make yeah. sure we had the right dynamic. There's no point me getting five people from the same industry, same type of job with the same skill set to come in and, and give me the same advice. Yeah. So um, I think the skills matrix was a big one. So, yeah, we, we got a really good mix in it at that time and yeah. um, helped sort of probably me as a, a young CEO get get to that next level to prepare ourselves for, for a proper board. Yeah. No, really cool. Technology has been a pretty important part for you and I know you guys have, have won a, a, an award for you know, Innovator of the Year Award yep. um, <clears throat> in, in your industry for your, um, your Notify platform there yep. how how did you go about disrupting you know the the, the traditional way of, of doing you know whether it be mortgage finance or asset finance and stuff like that in there what what really drove it yeah i think you know after being you know we've, we've been in in asset finance specifically for for 12 years you know we work with a lot of mortgage brokers a lot of car dealers a lot of other sort of financial professionals that yep. You know, we saw a real big opportunity for giving them um, the ability to offer asset finance to their their customers and mm-hmm. us to provide the right technology to do that in the right manner. And we really just tried to simplify that whole journey for, you know, customers from both B2C and B2B. Yep. So about four or five years ago, we, we built Notify, which was, um, you know, launched um, in our words, it's like a node for financial services, uh, hence Notify. But we launched launched that to to specifically cater for mortgage brokers to offer mm. asset finance because we saw an opportunity there. And you know, over the last four years, we've learned a lot to the point that we've just built our our second version of Notify, which yep. is um, a lot more flexible, agile, and uh, scalable platform. Yeah, um, a really good financial data model, and you know, an API driven platform that allows us to work with third parties a lot yep. more efficiently. So. We, we see that opportunity now as, you know, we want to power the growth of, of asset finance divisions within other businesses and partner mm-hmm. with people in ways that we're not necessarily the brand at the front. We let people be their own brand and we'll just power everything in the background. So yeah. that's sort of the philosophy at the moment is to, to really grow other businesses. Yeah, so it's about providing a platform Correct. For, for somebody else. Now, yeah. it, it's interesting there that just the philosophy behind that and the, the key thing that I really heard out of what you just said was right at the start, you said, yeah, we just really identified the customer focus mm. and, and how to make their journey easier or simplify that. Yeah. H- how do you go about finding out what that is? Yeah, I think financial services, there's so many friction points and red tape. The poor consumer who, ha- who hasn't worked in financial services <laughs> trying to navigate the process, you know, uh, and I'll, I'm a business owner in, in the industry and mm. um, my home loan a couple of years ago, I won't say which big four bank it was, <laughs> but there was one of them uh, I said to our business banker, send me the application form because, you know, it was obviously putting my home loan to them and there was two columns. I couldn't even fit my first name, my f- well, being Thomas, I couldn't even fit that into the first name bo- field on the on yeah. the application form and there was 16 pages and it was so small I could barely read the mm. – and, and we thought – this is a big four bank and it's just mm. a really good example of and a reminder of why we do what we do. Everything's digital. We try and use third-party data as much as we can to to make it easier for the customer and provide less keystrokes. Yeah. So um, while also educating them at the same time, we want our people dealing with their customers, not not doing mm. data entry. Yeah. So, no, and it's amazing, you know, just the identification of that and, mm. and it still staggers me whether it be the, the compliance division or the information gathering or whatever, how hard businesses make it for people to do business with them. <laughs> that that still staggers me. The, Blows those, my those, mind. Those friction points and, you know, compliance and red tape, you know, the, the business prevention divisions. <laughs> you know. Pretty much, pretty yeah. much. And I think that's where the opportunity is. I mean, there's regulatory change too at the moment that mm. that's providing us with opportunity because, you know, straight away we, mm. we've had interpretations of some of this regulatory change recently that we had 10 days to launch a whole new version of our platform, but we had to do it in preparation for January 1st. And 
Uh, we just moved all of our software engineers straight onto that for, for 10 days over the Christmas period because we had to get it done by then because yeah. we saw the opportunity. So, you know, we, we see when those, you know, business prevention departments, <laughs> uh, both in government and business, you know, changing changing the way we've got to do things. We, yeah. we recognise that's an opportunity too. Yeah, so. no, that's cool. Uh, and that probably leads me to the next thing. I mean, you just mentioned about, you know, regulatory changes and things like that. And the finance sector has been through a huge amount of <laughs> – well, it's had a massive spotlight a on it for, like, <laughs> for the last few years. H- how have you been able to uh, then effectively adapt to all those changes and the new provisions and all that sort of stuff to maintain your customer service levels and all that sort of stuff in line with the, you know, the the new goalposts that are, are set out of head office, if you like? Certainly, I think there's a, there's always a big fear factor to regulatory change. And, mm. and and like I said before, our, our focus has always been on how do we navigate that as efficiently and as we can to make it an opportunity. And, you know, over the last few years with the, the Hain Royal Commission was a, a pretty nervy time, especially for the mortgage brokers. I think the biggest thing for them was they were potentially going to lose their trail book, which was the value in the businesses they'd yeah, built. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the opportunities for us there was to, to also help help them protect their business and mm. and that's you know where we looked at uh, a notify was an opportunity for them to keep customers for more products mm. and, and potentially make more money that way so it is a it is a, a tough thing to navigate but we've got to each time there is something new that comes up we've just got to to look at, at what we've got to do for our mm. business and stay calm yeah. um, we can only control what we can control so there's there's things that uh, are still going to pop up this year mm. off the back of best interest duty that well, over, well out of our control. So yeah. we know at the end of November, I think it is now, I think it was extended by two months on Friday again for best interest duty to come mm. across our industry too. We've got time between now and then to prepare for that and we've got a very good idea of of how we think it's going to look, but we're mm. making sure our business is positioned for three or four different variables to make sure that when the new uh, framework comes in that we're geared for it. So yeah. Cool. I just want. To, oh, that's a really good point. I just want to touch on a couple of things there. About, you know, there's three or four different variables and how you come up with that. But the the other thing that you said, which I I think is a really good insight, perhaps in the way you go about things and the way that you lead your team, is that you know you look as change look at change as an opportunity. Yep. And there are so many businesses out there that look at changes. All oh, the sky's falling yep. in. <laughs> As opposed to, well, something changes, then that creates an opportunity to go and do something else. It opens, you know, you know that old one door closes, another one opens. <laughs> Definitely. So how do you how do you then assess that? As I guess, and, and review these different opportunities and and find these opportunities. As, you know, with your senior leadership team or your advisory board or board, how do you go about finding what these are and then implementing them or really exploiting them for what they're worth? Yeah, it's a it's a really good. Good question. I, I think our our team, if we look at you know with leading teams, one of our key behaviours is we embrace change. When we employ people, one of the first things we say is, look, we're a changing business. So one thing, if you if you don't like change, you're not prepared to learn and change. Mm. We're not the right group for you to work for. And you know we we will sit in the boardroom and look at what's what's coming. And my guys will be the the first to say that I love a whiteboard. And a, <laughs> almost every meeting, I end up doing something on the whiteboard and. I've got a good team that probably uh, pull me back a bit sometimes because sometimes yep. I'm looking too far ahead. So we get on the whiteboard and just have a good old fashioned session of yep. um, spitballing against the wall, and we figure out, you know, what are the opportunities because yep. there is always going to be some, and it, it can be something really small that we've got to tweak that can actually be, you know, hidden gems. So mm. it's just giving everyone a voice and talking about talking about it and, yeah. and letting them come up with some of the ideas too. No, so. that's really cool. It's such an underrated business tool, the whiteboard, isn't it? Oh, it is. I love it. I've, I think I've got two in my office, you know, yeah. one on wheels, one on the wall. And at one point, I think my, my last office, the entire wall, was we painted it as a whiteboard. Yeah. So you was, can't have too many of them. No, you never can. You can never have too many whiteboards. <laughs> I know in our office, we've, we've got actually, we had big glass windows yeah. in the offices and we covered them all with the whiteboard yeah, stuff. Yeah, ours, so. ours with the software team looked like a bit of a, a – an, chemistry lab or something up yeah. on the wall where there's that many codes and variables up on the wall. It's um, it's quite entertaining because yeah. I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really cool. Now, mate, over your time, the business has won a couple of pretty significant awards. You know, Telstra Small Business of the Year and, the, and then you won the Innovation Award for the Notified platform as well. How important has, has those awards been to, I guess, establish brand credibility and, and help your growth 
Yeah, it's a good good question. I think you know, I think the the Telstra Business uh, Award was probably the the big one for us that we I think we got a bit of credibility for for what we were doing. You know, there was it's quite a rigorous process that that yeah. whole um, that whole uh, experience and and it was a very good experience too. You mm. get a, a really good business health check and it's just a it is a good process to sort of benchmark yourself. Yeah. So for us, we we were quite blown away uh, when we did win that. Look at it. It's not going to help you grow your business as such because mm. that comes down to the people. But um, it certainly opened up a few doors with people, and and it allowed us to um, to probably be a bit more confident in what we were doing. Yeah, um, okay. I think was the big thing. You know, we we like I said, we're a young team, so and we were obviously a lot younger then. So mm. and then off the back of the the innovation award with the uh, with Momentum Media, that you know that was a, another piece for for Notify a few years ago. And mm. you know, I, I suppose the exciting thing for us is we look at that platform at, at what we've built. And when COVID hit, we put the blinkers on and completely rebuilt our tech stack from the yeah. ground up. And and that's you know giving us some. Um, really exciting opportunities for the future now because we're you know we're about to to roll it out as of the we're not going to do first of April because it's yeah. probably not the best day but it'll probably be the second <laughs> <laughs> April Fool's Day not a good day <laughs> <laughs> no very cool with the business you've diversified into some other stuff as as well and you know how do you find as an entrepreneur not to chase too many rabbits like you know we can all suffer a little bit from magpie syndrome and what's the next <laughs> shiny thing. How do you stay on task and 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 focus on core business without being dragged off in in fifteen different directions? Yeah, that's if anyone can give me the exact solution, I'll <laughs> I'll thank them. But um, I think it's getting good people around you. People are key uh, to to a good business and having a, a team that can say no mm. and slow down and and getting that ongoing feedback is um, is important. I think and so so for me. I recognise that that is one of my faults. You know, did a strengths assessment <laughs> and had a look, and you know, I think forward thinking was one of the uh, the number one strengths of my profile. And you know, I I, I tend to certainly in the past have, have bitten off more than I could chew. Mm. But as I'm maturing and getting older, I've certainly learnt from. I, I won't call them mistakes, but because I think they're both they're all valuable lessons. Mm. Um, any mistake that that could be looked at. Uh, like that in in the past has has been a, a really valuable lesson for me to grow and develop as a leader. So yeah. it is hard to slow down though because we can get pretty excited over yeah. over anything. So yeah, I, think I used to go to um, Dreamforce every year for for Salesforce over in San yeah. Fran and. The guys would see me leave and go, oh, "What's he going to come back with next time?" And <laughs> I'd always come back with something, something new for them, and all these different ideas. And they knew just to pretty much slow me down for that month after. Yeah, so. we, we had the same challenges in our business. We, you know, whether it be with peer groups or other thing that we went and do, and and, and they just dread, oh, you know, Andrew's gone away again. He's going to come <laughs> back with fifteen more things to do, and we haven't finished the fifteen from the last yep. time that we went away. So. And yeah, even though you've got that embracing change mm. culture uh, around that, how how do you temper that? Because I, I think that, you know that 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 challenge of of because being aware of new things that are coming up and these new ideas, but we also got to be really careful not to burn your team out with Correct. too much stuff as well. Yeah. So how do you balance it with them? Ongoing feedback's the biggest thing. You know, getting that in the moment and. I, I probably seek out a bit of feedback from the guys too, yeah, um, in, in as a, a constructive format as possible. But it is a big thing that uh, there, there has been opportunities that we've said no to, yeah, which have set us up for a lot bigger opportunities. And yeah, I think that's the the key thing there is that you know my lesson would be of of knowing when to say no and when to recognise that an opportunity might not be right for you. And in in June last year, we made some big decisions on the future of our business and. Mm. You know some some partnerships and opportunities that were there that that you know we we did a review of and said that that's not for us and you know I think it, it puts us in a really you know exciting position for this year and yeah uh, the buzz we've got around the team because we made a decision to put the blinkers on mm. and um and and be really focused so I think you know for me the last twelve months has probably been the biggest learning curve of of my life but. Yeah. The first probably month, I, I don't want to ever go through that again. But yeah. since then, I think we are running a better business. Yeah. Um, and that's just simply through probably saying no to, to things we would have said yes to in the past. Yeah. So I think it's really important. It just avoids that change fatigue within the team. It does. It and, does. And just keeps you laser focused on some key things. I think the, the change bit probably comes more so from, you know, we're always going to be rolling out new features, functionality mm. in, in our tech and things like that. And we're doing things to 
to make our staff members' jobs easier and, mm. and things like that. So they're always going to have changes in processes and yeah. uh, that are that are really you know really small, yeah. but they can have a lot bigger effects. So yeah. you know, getting everyone in that mindset when they come you know come into the doors for for day one, yeah. you know, that's the the expectation we have. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, mate, you, you talked about about those opportunities and when to say no. I, I can imagine that you know you're giving you you know advisory board and a board that you know strategic planning and accountability and and you know checking in on the progress of these things is something that's probably culturally pretty important in terms of what you do. Mm-hmm. Can you share your your process? Like, do you do you do as a senior leadership team a couple of days off site? Do you get external facilitators in? How do you go about? establishing the clear strategy, you know, whether it be five years, three years, one year, 90 days for the business to go and execute. What, what's the process you guys follow? Yeah, so we've, we've probably used a mixture of, of all of all of those. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we do find a facilitator certainly helps those mm-hmm. off-sites. So we, we do do um, off-sites generally, you know, we're, we're actually due in, in April. We're, we're finalising mm-hmm. our three-year plan now and our yep. – um, our sort of one page plan, you know, with the last 12 months has been focused on on the now and the future as best as we could. But, yeah. you know, if we look at our business plan that we're about to write will be quite different to what it was 12 months mm. ago because it's a different world and, and we've learned some really valuable lessons. But a, a facilitator is a, a, a big one for us because if it's just us running it alone, you know, we can get sidetracked. And, yeah. and sometimes I think the facilitator's job, you know, some of the questions they ask and challenge you on, um, when it's uh, someone else's opinion coming in, provide some some pretty valuable solutions that that we end up workshopping. Yeah, so. yeah I found we we used to because you know this is a lot of stuff we do. Mm. You know, we used to try and facilitate and run our own sessions, but then yeah, you're trying to be a facilitator and a participant, and you yeah. just can't do it. It's tough. It's yeah. tough because then you sometimes you well you don't get a hundred percent of your attention. Yeah, no, so. exactly right, uh, mate. What are some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome in your career? I reckon the biggest one would. Would probably be. I started out so young. That was probably a quite a challenge early days. I don't think yeah. people took you seriously. So there was a fair few hurdles to jump over. I think in in that time, and I think it it took you know a good four or five years to build up that credibility at a yeah. young age. I mean, I finished school when I was seventeen, and um, so I was twenty one when we set the business up. And yeah. It was just before my twenty first birthday. So yeah. Running a company at that age was, you know, was quite daunting. So yeah. I think the the other part was we we were growing quickly too mm. uh, from from such an early age, an early age in the business. So um, that was probably my biggest challenge. But yeah. as the business has grown, you know, one of the, the the most valuable lessons is is learning how to let go of things sometimes yeah. and not get emotionally invested in decisions sometimes. Yeah. Um, make calculated business decisions. Yeah. So I think it's easy to, when it is your business and it's your baby, to get a bit passionate. Yeah. So I'm the first to do that. But, uh, you know, as you get older, you, you learn to probably relax a little more and, and stay focused. Yeah, cool. Um, mate, what about some of the goals that you're yet to accomplish? Yeah, you know, like you said, yeah, you've been a really fast ride for you yeah. for the last, you know, 10 or 12 years. Yeah, um, still, still a lot of years ahead of you. There is, there is, and you know, and, and there is lots of opportunity. You know, I think the last probably four to six weeks has has provided us with you know undoubtedly the most exciting opportunities you know for the future of our business, mm. and 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 suddenly some of those opportunities are far bigger than we we probably thought. But I think you know, for me, there's. Um, you know, it's not necessarily an ASX listed company or, or you know, uh, something like that in particular, but it's probably just growing something that we can look back and be really proud of. There's a lot of things that we we talk about wanting to do. You know, I think we're getting to a spot now that we can ac- actually execute on because we've got the right tech stack yep. and we've got the right people. And now uh, from here, the only thing that can get in the way, I think, is our execution, yeah. which, you know, is, is quite exciting. So, That's um, really cool. Lots to tick off, probably pages, but yeah. as long as I can still travel when the world opens up again, <laughs> you know, that, that will be uh, important for us. Yeah. Cool. Mate, do you have a bucket list? I, I've, I haven't got probably an updated one. I've got a bucket list of, um, of trips I've wanted to, to accomplish, yeah. so it, it probably more revolves for me around travel and it's, it's a bit obsessive, but, yeah. you know, my, my wallpaper in my office is a whole wall that's a world map when I've got green dots on all the cities I've, nice. I've visited around the world and that's my little inspiration and, yeah. and that's sort of my bucket list because, you know, I think most of it involves just travelling. Yeah. So No, that's really cool. Mate, do you have a life motto? Probably, yeah, I reckon my, probably the one I, 
there's probably two I repeat a lot, which is uh, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, I remember sitting there with one of our guys uh, at, at work and we were going over to a meeting with a couple of CEOs from, from some asset assisted companies. Mm. This was about four years ago and he, he was getting a bit nervous on the plane and I said to him, mate, I was like, you're an important part of the future of the business. Yeah. Just keep getting comfortable with being uncomfortable because mm. you'll walk out of that meeting if you know what you're talking about, which what we do, you, you, you do then you'll be fine. And yeah. I think over the next 18 months, he was up on stage at conferences in front of 500 people doing, you know, presentations and things like yeah, that. Yeah. So that that's one. And um, the other is we've we've always got to strive for perfection, knowing we'll never get there. And, yeah. and that's just probably the, that continuous improvement mentality yep. is that the moment we stop trying to improve, while sometimes it might not be the right decision, we will make a mistake, but we've got to continue trying to improve as a business. Because I think the, yeah. the rate of change in business and if you just look at the last 12 months oh. it's it's insane and it, yeah and it's it's um it's just getting faster and faster the rate yeah. of change and you know we've got to continue looking at at that yeah. um while staying focused yeah so, no i mean i think mate you make some really good points there and uh, you know that especially for fast growing business or fast moving businesses yeah, you know, having a team like you said, that embrace change but are comfortable being out of their comfort zone yep. it is critical to be able to move that forward. Definitely. Um, and if you don't have them, you know, they, they quickly get, you know, tailed off a bit like a dog chasing behind a yeah. car. <laughs> they eventually they just can't they, they just can't keep up. hundred percent. Um but you know, also that yeah, you know, I, I love the, you know, strife of perfection, not mm. knowing you're getting there. It's just about you're never gonna be the best. Yeah. But it's just about being that bit better every day. Exactly. And, and, and I think there's some really important learnings in there is stop, you know, stop, you know, you, you strive for trying to achieve the unachievable. You never give up. You just yeah. sort of keep moving towards it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's a, a big thing. And, and that's why, you know, I, I truly believe that's probably where we are is is the, you know, there's there's a, a core senior group that mm. that are all on, on that page. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it certainly feels a lot better in uh, 2021, uh, to, to look forward to this year than, than yeah, last year. That's very cool. <laughs> Mate, I know you got your advisory board, but do you have personally, do you have a, a mentor or a coach or somebody like that that you work with? I, I have just started with a, a new CEO coach, actually, who, yeah. I'm, uh, who I'm really excited to, to do some work with. So he's got a, a, a psychology background as well. Yeah. So he, he can provide some really good insights into his certain behaviours and, and yeah. things like that. So um, I've had my first session with him, which has been great. But yeah. I, I've been really fortunate in the past from from quite a young age to build relationships with some good people in the industry, in business, in mm -hmm. technology that – have allowed me to probably, you know, kind of have a network of, of mentors that I can bounce bounce off. Yep. You know, I can go to Sydney and have a have a bite to eat and be sitting there with uh, some people that five or six years ago I would have never thought I would have been having dinner with. And yeah. uh, for me, I'm just like a sponge in conversations like that. That yeah. you know, they, they've kind of become unofficial mentors and, and yeah. friends that can just give answers to questions that you know, we, we might not have the answers for. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've probably got, there'd be five or six key ones that yep. I'd ring regularly and have a chat with. And that's probably the way I've I've worked it. Nothing mm. formal, but, yeah. you know, more just having a good network. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Mate, thank you for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. I'm Tom Caesar, CEO and co-founder of Positive Group. Thank you for joining us on The Little Black Book. <laughs>